Welcome to the e-learning series, Improving Cancer Outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander People, developed by the Tactics Centre of Research Excellence in collaboration with the Psycho-Oncology Cooperative Research Group. The e-learning series is designed to build confidence and technical expertise among researchers and clinicians working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Module 3 was developed for a wide range of audiences to increase diversity, equity and inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in clinical trials and clinical research. Please refer to the POCOG website www.pocog.org.au for other modules. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters, community and culture. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. At the end of this module, you will have a good understanding of why it is important to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in clinical trials, the barriers and facilitators of participation in clinical trials by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and factors that need to be considered and addressed in order to improve opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to participate in clinical trials. Let's first discuss why clinical trials are important. Clinical trials are important because they contribute to improving health care by identifying whether new diagnostics, treatments and other innovations are safe and effective. Clinical trials can be used across the cancer continuum, but treatment trials are the most common cancer trials. Treatment can include drugs, radiation therapy, surgery, palliative care, counselling and psychological support complementary and alternative therapies, and so on. Patients who take part in trials tend to have better outcomes. Why does it matter whether Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are included in clinical trials? As the first module in our e-learning series makes clear, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have poorer cancer outcomes than other Australians. Given these inequalities, it is important for reasons of equity, and social justice that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have an opportunity to take part in and benefit from clinical trials. To date, there is an underrepresentation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in clinical trials and so, from a scientific standpoint, it is important to ensure diversity in trials. Participants in trials should reflect the population affected by the disease. Diversity in trials is important because we can't be sure that everyone will respond in the same way. For example, if we only study men, how can we be sure that the effect of treatment will be the same for women? Will older people respond the same as younger people? People can also respond differently to treatment for a range of genetic and environmental reasons and it is important to know whether there is variation in response to treatment in different groups. If we don't include diverse populations in trials, we won't know whether this is the case. Disparities in cancer mortality between the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population and non-Indigenous Australians can provide insight into where research and policy attention are needed to close the gap. Cancer is the leading cause of death for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The cancer death rates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have continued to increase for almost two decades, whilst they have decreased for non-Indigenous Australians over this same time period, so the gap is getting bigger. Inequalities in cancer care and outcomes experienced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people occur at every point of the cancer continuum. These differences are cumulative in effect, which is evidenced in the significantly higher cancer mortality rates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Given these inequalities, it is important for reasons of equity and social justice that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have an opportunity to take part in and benefit from 
clinical trials. What do we know about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's participation in clinical trials? In trying to answer this question, it is helpful to make a distinction between trials specifically aimed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their organisations, and those that are not specifically aimed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but which they may be eligible. For example, international drug trials. Participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in trials not specifically aimed at them is unknown. However, based on information recorded in the Australian and New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry, there have been well over a hundred trials focused solely or substantially on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. These are the ones to the right of your screen in blue. These trials have focused on different conditions than those studied in general Australian trials. While not all of these trials were related to treatment and relatively few have focused on cancer, it is clear that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people do participate in trials in the right circumstances. We will come back to what the right circumstances might look like a bit later in this presentation. As far as participation in cancer clinical trials that are not specifically aimed at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the current answer is we really don't know. This information has not been reported. Sometimes because information on Indigenous status was not collected. Sometimes because the numbers were too small to allow separate reporting without compromising the privacy of participants. Indigenous status is included as part of the minimum demographic data set to be collected for each participant in trials conducted under the auspices of the Cancer Australia funded National Cancer Collaborative Trials Group, including POCOG. So hopefully this information will become available in the future. Even so, this will only provide information on those people who make it through the various barriers to participation. So what are these barriers? There has been growing national and international interest in understanding the barriers and enablers to participation in clinical trials for underrepresented groups. Most of this work has come from the United States, but it is likely to be relevant in Australia. In Australia, some specific research has been conducted to identify the barriers and enablers to participation in cancer clinical trials for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Some key documents include those shown on this screen. They are freely available online, and the links to these are provided at the end of this module. Let's first discuss some of the barriers to participation identified in the existing literature. These have been grouped into three broad categories focused on the patient, the clinician, and the trials themselves. The list on the screen is not exhaustive. Some key barriers include individuals' mistrust of research and health services and research institutions and a perceived harm or fear, a lack of knowledge about trials, both in general and about specific trial opportunities that may be relevant for potential participants, a lack of care provider knowledge about relevant open trials, various language and communication issues, particularly related to ineffective cross-cultural communication, and the complexity of content that needs to be covered. Gatekeeping, which means that taking part in a trial is not even discussed with the patient, often as a result of implicit or explicit bias. Lack of staff diversity. Logistical challenges including transportation, accommodation, caring responsibilities, and cost. And several aspects of study design including stringent inclusion and exclusion criteria, where, when, and how the study is being conducted, the type of cancer being studied, study materials that are not appropriate with respect to language, literacy levels, and or cultural beliefs and practices, and more general, lack of consideration of culture in the design of the trial. Of all these barriers, Arguably, the most important are those related to gatekeeping and study design. 
There are also some quotes from health professionals in the box from research conducted in the US to highlight some of these barriers. Although the barriers listed on the previous slide are likely to be relevant for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, very little information was available. Recently, an analysis of publicly available information on the Australia and New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry website was undertaken to identify factors that may systematically reduce opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to participate in clinical trials. The full details of this study are available in the published paper listed on this slide. The study looked at 365 cancer treatment studies conducted between 2014 and 2018 and examined the location of the trial sites, the types of cancer studied, and the study's inclusion and exclusion criteria. Some of the key study findings concluded that there was a mismatch between where trials are run and where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live and the types of cancers studied and the cancers most common among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. More than a third of trials included at least one explicit statement about the investigator exercising judgment about whether to include a particular patient, usually in relation to the potential participant's ability to comply with the protocol or having a condition or characteristic that could compromise the study or create risk for the participant. While it makes sense to be sure that the trials choose the right participants, it raises the possibility that some patients, including some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients, will be seen as risky or too hard and therefore left out. Taken as a whole, the findings of this study suggest that the barriers we've talked about and those identified in the literature are highly relevant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We now turn to the literature on the key facilitators of participation and strategies that may help to increase opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Among the key facilitators identified in the literature are a commitment to inclusion by both individuals and institutions. This includes building inclusion into the study design for example, through increased protocol flexibility. Genuine, enduring partnerships, including relationship building, early engagement, addressing community identified priorities or needs, and community leadership and guidance. Creating community partnerships and involving the community throughout the research process are essential, and it is necessary to allow time and resources to support this. Cultural competency is also an important factor, and this requires increasing the cultural competency of both clinicians and researchers. Targeted recruitment of underrepresented groups has also been effective. This could include using community health services, schools, and other community organizations and community media outlets. Addressing practical barriers such as assisting with logistical and cost barriers is important, as is ensuring appropriate study teams by employing bicultural or bilingual staff and training and supporting researchers from diverse communities. Appropriate study materials also need to be developed with input from community-based staff to ensure appropriate languages, wording, appearance, and content. In terms of study design, it is important to recognize that genuine involvement of stakeholders and the development of strong partnerships will and should impact on and shape all aspects of the trial design and conduct. This also includes shifting the balance towards pragmatic clinical trials that focus on the needs of groups that are disproportionately affected by cancers rather than on particular types of cancer. Many of the things that facilitate participation are included in the National Clinical Trials Governance Framework, which was recently developed under the auspices of the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Partnering with consumers is a central component of the framework, and equity is a core underpinning principle. 
including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in clinical trials, is explicitly addressed under Action 1.4 and also in other sections of the document. The framework lists specific strategies to meet each action and the suggested strategies for Action 1.4 are presented in the next two slides. In brief, the strategies to meet Action 1.4 include undertaking trials that meet the priorities of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, improving access to trials by employing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander liaison officers, setting workforce participation targets for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across the various roles involved in clinical trials, providing cultural mentors for non-Indigenous clinical trials staff, collaborating with Aboriginal community-controlled health organisations and adopting a holistic model of health and well-being in the design, planning and implementation of clinical trial services. This section also includes reviewing the appropriateness and effectiveness of clinical trial services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, engaging with community to promote engagement with research and to improve health literacy, communication across organisations, communities and governing bodies, evaluating and reporting on initiatives to improve service provision, and providing clinical trials information in language. It can be hard to translate the evidence from academic literature into concrete action on the ground. There's a useful American document about achieving diversity, inclusion and equity in clinical trials developed by the Multi-Regional Clinical Trials Center of the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard University. It covers a broad range of topic areas shown here on the slide and has lots of useful detail about each area. The accompanying toolkit includes guidance in using logic models to put these suggestions into practice and to enable planning, measurement and monitoring and evaluation of strategies to increase diversity, inclusion and equity in trials. Together with the Australian National Clinical Trials Governance Framework mentioned in the previous slides, these are very handy resources for anyone involved in clinical trials. An example from the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Centre's resources is about communicating information throughout the clinical trial life cycle. Trial information includes recruitment materials, consent forms, study procedures and more. Plain language and clear design are key to presenting information in a way that is easy to understand. This slide shows an example of patient instructions on how to administer study medication. Note the design features and formatting which improve readability and communicate the important information. Health literacy refers to how people access, understand and use health information in order to make decisions related to their health. And part of that is acknowledging the responsibility of the communicator to ensure that the information being shared is designed to be understood by the target audience. When communicating about clinical trials with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, information should be inclusive, readable, usable and accessible, and be shared in a way that is simple, easy to understand, respectful, engaging and uses a patient-centered approach. Researchers and health practitioners can do many things to make sure Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a fair chance of being in clinical trials. We need to accept that meaningful participation by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is essential and indispensable. It needs to happen at all levels and all stages of research. It needs to be adequately supported, culturally safe and well resourced. One way to achieve this is to employ staff from the relevant population in the study team. A strong relationship between the research team and the community supports culturally appropriate research. We also need to find out what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities want to gain from being involved in research. 
This could include training, skills, personalized medical information, better health monitoring, or benefits to the community. Research needs to be ethically conducted, and anyone involved in research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be guided by the additional considerations outlined by the National Health and Medical Research Council and the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Relevant documents are included in the reference list at the end of the presentation. Appropriate methods will adopt a strengths-based approach to research and decolonizing methodologies that create meaningful partnerships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We need to know whether everyone has equitable access to clinical trials and we need to ensure the systematic collection and reporting of Indigenous status. This information should be collated and reported regularly in a way that protects the confidentiality of research participants. We need to upskill the health and research workforce to ensure cultural safety for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and overcome gatekeeping in clinical trials. This requires recognising and addressing implicit and explicit biases and inequities. Genuine engagement by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and organisations requires trust, and we need to remember that trustworthiness is a prerequisite. Researchers are responsible for establishing this trust. Minority populations have been systematically excluded from research or have only been included when research is done to them. This has created mistrust in the entire health system, including research. It's not enough to ask people to trust us. Researchers need to show they deserve that trust. Building trust requires ongoing attention. It takes considerable time and effort to build and can be quickly and easily broken. We need to question and consider every aspect of a trial and be genuinely open to change based on input from stakeholders and community members. There is significant scope to address key barriers. For example, by modifying rigid inclusion and exclusion criteria, considering study duration and location, reflecting on the characteristics of trial teams, increasing flexibility in protocols and governance, and ensuring study materials are culturally relevant and easy to read. Most importantly, researchers should question whether the research includes outcomes that are valued by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Ensuring equity requires active planning for diversity and inclusion from the very beginning. It is far too important to simply leave it to chance. Now that you have a better understanding of why it is important to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in clinical trials, the barriers and facilitators to their participation, and factors that need to be considered and addressed to improve opportunities for their participation, we invite you to think about what you can do to make equitable access to clinical trials a reality for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this module. You can find the first two modules in our series on the POCOG website, www.pocog.org.au, or finding POCOG on YouTube. Links to key references are included on the next screen.